All right, guys, we're back. Another week of interviews from Eric, courtesy of Eric Holmes. This is Flick City, I believe, episode 91. Eric, tell our listeners what interviews you have for this particular episode. Well, we got Javier Arena, the writer and director of a movie called Do Justice, starring Jeff Fahey and Kellen Lutz, Efren Ramirez. Uh, we had a pretty good conversation. I think I may have slightly put my foot in my mouth, but... It, Why you know, would you it, do that? You're, tr- you're trying to have a conversation, right? Yeah. I just had, and we mentioned on the regular show, like, I kind of saw this as a sort of a superhero origin story to some degree, and he did not agree with that, but it wasn't like, screw you, you're wrong. It was just friendly disagreement, I guess. Other than that, I got some uh, really good information from him. Uh, kind of talking about sort of his past as far as past editing, bit of writing he's done in the past. And and I believe he was a script supervisor in a movie called The Dying Game. When you get a filmmaker that's been doing it for so long and doing so many jobs for so long, it's kind of interesting to hear how did that job you did like 20, 30 years ago inform your, your filmmaking today? And so we got into a bunch of stuff. And Okay. Well, you gave it on the regular show. You gave it, th- you called it a three-star banger. So what yeah. kind of people will like Do Justice, which again, it's it's in theaters and on digital and on demand November 24th. What will this appeal to, this movie, Do Justice? Beyond the superhero origin thing that I pointed out, this is a crime thriller. I believe I compared it to The Ritual Killer. And I think people that are in the movies kind of like that. Because I, I don't think I am. Ever- Yeah. Oh, so am I. But those kind of movies I don't think are for everyone, but I think the people that are really dig them kind of like we do. And so I think those people that dig movies like that will really gravitate towards due justice. I think they'll get a lot out of it. Other people might see it and go think it's all right, but I don't think they're going to fall over it like I did and like you might. But, you know, that's the whole point of a three-star banger. If you're into it, you're going to love it. And if you're not into it, then maybe not your kind of movie. movie that is your kind of movie is Liberty. What made it special for you? And who are you interviewing for that? Yeah, so this one, I was uh, uh, interviewing the writer and director, Phil DeWitty. Didn't know I was going to interview Nicholas Michael McGovern. He's the lead actor in this. Oh, you were surprised Um, when you saw him in the Zoom? Yeah, well, I didn't recognize him at first. (laughs) Cool. He, he had his he had his name on the on the corner there. I was like Nicholas Moon. Oh, he's the a hole in this movie, <laughs> 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 or the uh, protagonist slash antagonist. I mean, he's definitely an antagonist, but he's also like the main character in the movie. Yeah, basically, it's a guy kidnaps a bunch of people, puts them behind cages, and then just kind of videotapes their reaction to being you know their lifestyle behind the cages and then the whole idea is to match that footage up with footage of animals in zoos animals in captivity and see how similar they are and if me putting these humans in captivity is so horrible imagine what these uh, animals feel maybe we should rethink that then that's that's the big idea you know maybe we should rethink how we treat animals does it work as more than okay it's a me- it has that message but does it work as sort of that maybe a b-movie type thriller pain tense kind so of thing it does but also another thing i didn't mention on the regular show is he breaks a fourth wall a lot even to the point where like the the opening voiceover he's directly talking to the audience saying you're a participant in this so it's got a little of uh a little funny games vibes to it in some of it where that's pretty gutsy um, that could either work for some or just absolutely they may check out that kind yeah, of but I, you know, I th- I think just the fact, and similar to funny games, it's like I don't think a character in a movie saying you're complicit in the torture of this person uh, makes you complicit in torture. I don't believe that because the characters aren't real. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like if I go to find Matthew, I'm not gonna. I can't find Matthew. Matthew doesn't exist. N- Nicholas McGov- M- uh, Nicholas Michael McGovern exists. Matthew does not. Matthew's a figment of uh, Phil DeWitt's brain. But the ideas still come through. That same deal with funny games. It's like, oh, yeah, you're complicit. You wanted us to torture these innocent people. It's like, no, these are characters. These don't exist. (laughs) Yeah, but I fully understand the point you're making and agree to a certain extent. But like, I don't take that stuff too personally. But to your point, 
some people might. I just think taking that too personally is you're missing the point and you're being a little too uh, a little too defensive about something. Maybe it, the maybe the reason you're being defensive is because you're not not so much complicit in what's going on in the movie, but complicit in something that the movie is trying to address. And you give this movie a, a pretty high score with four and a half. What made it yeah. stick for you as far as just a bit? What's four and a half? It's almost five. It's yeah. really. I mean, it definitely works as a, a thriller, you know, deep as the material is. It's also entertaining and funny. I mentioned the 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 humor in the the interview, but I don't think it came across how funny this movie can get. I don't even think it's coming across now. It's just you'll you'll watch it and you'll notice there's a ton of dark humor in this. Definitely worth checking out. Don't know what I can say about the uh poster for Liberty. It looks like they just kind of came up with that, <laughs> you know earlier today <laughs> but uh don't what was don't let the poster one? distract you that this is a very that's it's an excellent yes film. okay well, there, so. there was a there was another movie to catch a killer i think that was it where like the okay. poster was like right. there's been a couple of movies where like you look at the poster and it's like why that like that okay. that's just gonna turn people away and then you watch that movie and it's like don't judge a movie by its poster <laughs> don't but rather the content <laughs> by its poster okay so we are off with our first interview is with what do justice filmmaker javier reina reina yep. i believe it. Reina. and then and then our second segment will be a liberty interview with director writer phil dewitt did you say yeah. dwight uh, DeWitt? DeWitt, DeWitty, and Witty? Uh, I, I, I always ask him at or the horrible. beginning. Yeah. Yeah. And I, yeah. So I was like, is it Phil DeWitt? DeWitt? It's definitely, I'm pretty sure it's not DeWitt. I think it's DeWitty oh. or DeWitt. Okay. Okay. All right. We'll, we'll, we'll figure that out. Listeners, yeah. you know what? We're doing all the work here. Why don't listeners, why don't you do the work and, and go YouTube Phil DeWitty or De- DeWitt and tell us how to pronounce it correctly. You, you know what I need to start doing? <laughs> just kidding, listeners. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Yes, sir. What, what I need to start doing is going back and listening to the interview <laughs> before we do these <laughs> intros. It's like, it's actually Phil DeWitty because uh, I just listened to it 10 seconds ago. But with my goldfish brains, that might not help as much as I think it might. Thank you, listeners, for being patient with us. Eric and I are really horrible. We get an F- minus for our research and last name <laughs> pronunciations for these movies. And yeah, again, Nicholas, Michael McGovern, and Phil, however you pronounce his last name, Dewitty or Dwight, for Liberty. So tell us what you think of these movies, of these interviews. Thank you, Eric Holmes. Final thoughts before we go. Uh, yeah, just uh, check these movies out there. They're really good. And uh, they're, they're really good and they're different, like like night and day different from each other. So good times, great oldies. Light 101.9. You're listening to Cinematics. <laughs> <laughs> good times. Good times. We're out. Slimy Srizavosti and Eric Holmes. Eric Ham Slime Holmes are, are out. We'll see you guys. But I'm here with the director, Javier Reina, the director of Do Justice. This was kind of a fun, fun movie, kind of like a, a pulpy thriller. I don't know what your take on this was, but I kind of saw this as a uh, almost like a superhero origin of sorts. More, uh, less Spider-Man and more Punisher. But uh, what was kind of the antithesis of this and how did this movie start about? Oh, well, first of all, I'm, I'm kind of up to here with superheroes. Yeah. So I... I'm always trying to think, okay, that's great, but how do I relate to that guy? You know, like I will watch Dark Knight, which I love. Like, yeah, if I had a guy like that, I also help people, <laughs> you know? And, uh, but, you know, I was thinking as a regular human being, uh, you know, how will you actually do anything uh, meaningful to create, to come up from an event like this? And everything came from uh, uh, Sandy Hook. Okay. And that totally hit me in the, like a, kick in the stomach, the whole thing in the, uh, Newtown, Connecticut. And I, I was a dad of two little kids at the time. So it was very easy to relate to the pain of what some of those parents could be going through. And and that was the, the thing I kept thinking, you know, what would I do if uh, something like that would happen to my kids? And I will see uh, a lot of people saying that, you know, they're I don't know. They believe in a lot of good things, and they they have to forgive and let it go. And and I guess I realized I'm not a very nice person because I just went darker and darker, and I just wanted to hurt whoever would have done that. And then the guy killed himself, and so you you feel like no satisfaction in a way. So I started to think kind of like Santiago in the movie. You know, I would do this and I would do that until you realize, well, what if somebody actually did it? And that's where Max came from. I tried to give him a little background with some experience in some things, but I wanted to be a, a person who's already struggling somehow, and all of a sudden everything is taken away from him. 
but he's not a superhero. You know, it's a, it's a regular dude. Yeah. No, no superpowers. Wow. Yeah, yeah. He did, definitely doesn't have energy beams coming out of his hands. I, I see you've done like a lot of writing and a lot of directing. Uh, is there one or the other you prefer? I'm guessing the way you describe how this movie came about, I'm guessing you uh, get a lot of uh, your emotions out through the page, I assume. Yeah, everything I, I've written is, is not because I'm great at it or anything. It's just stuff I experienced or I heard or had conversations with. So, uh, for instance, uh, a good example is the conversation of um, Santiago with his kids in the car. You know, I had that conversation telling my kids I'm broke, and the other one is like, I want to go to Japan. I'm like, are you kidding me? I want a truck. And, and I was like, okay, you know, we don't see these things. And, and I wanted to see a movie that reflects a little bit of what a regular dad would go through while having a job, stuff like that. When you ask me what do I prefer, I always, I, I grew up, Basically, in the 70s, I my first fantasy was after watching Jaws. And I came out of Jaws going like, oh, my God, this is incredible. And I just love movies from that moment on. There is a time when you realize nobody's saying, hey, why don't you direct this for me? And I said, well, I had to write something. And I was a late bloomer. And I did a lot of things in the uh, 90s and trying to do things. And I became a, a stay-at-home dad. And then I'm like, when I'm getting old, uh, I'm not going to have a second chance. So uh, I started adapting a book I liked, which was Region Red, which is a previous little movie I did. And then uh, I started putting all these ideas I had in my head into a piece of paper. I really pre-edited, just like it's like the movie on paper, so I could just do them. So technically, I started writing as a, a way for me to do something and get a job. Yeah. And uh, your cast in this, like Jeff Fahey, he's great in everything. Uh, you know, yes, uh, enough can't be said about him. But I uh, did uh, mention uh, Efren Ramirez, who he he he's a pretty fun character. Like, uh, what what was it like, kind of uh, coming up with those characters? And then, like, when you write something, and then you get uh, these talented actors saying your words, what's that like, kind of uh, watching what you put on the page come to life? Oh well, it's uh, it, it feels fantastic just to see. Something I imagine all of a sudden uh, a friend is saying it better than I imagine it, uh, and nailing it and giving me the expression. I remember some of the things about Santiago is that I wanted to see a lot of. Uh, I didn't want to have just a tough cop, you know. I, I wanted to have somebody who was very vulnerable, but from outside this looks like a, a closed door, but inside the guy has feelings all over, and even the little scenes like when he said that crazy lady's house and some guy is a little a gigantic TV. He has this look and these brown poppy eyes, you know, is telling me what he's thinking. And I could see his his uh his brain cooking what's going on here. So he just feels great when just with that look he can do something that you wanted him to say. And then boom, one look does it. I don't know what the budget for this is, but uh do you know what the budget when you're writing something, do you generally know what the budget for the movie is? Before you no. write it, or do you just write it and you're like, oh, crap, we don't have this budget. We're going to have to figure out a way to do well, this, or we might know, have to I, cut that scene, so on and so forth. Yeah, I mean, you start with great ideas. I want to do this, and I'm thinking, okay, okay, let's say I, I, somebody says, let's make this movie. Are they going to give me $50 million? No, because I'm a nobody, so they're going to get somebody else to do it. So how do I get to do it? So I've been trying to to write with a budget in mind. You know, uh, you know, I'm not going to plan any time sooner a UFO crashing into Bainbridge Island and Seattle goes in flames. So I try to keep things as realistic as possible. And just considering that I'm not going to have the money to do it. Well, assuming IMDb is to be believed, uh, it says you were uh, back in 95, you were a script supervisor on Dying Game. Uh, yeah. What is what is a script supervisor? Uh, what what was your job as that? And then how has that kind of informed your writing going forward or just filmmaking in general going on? That's a good question. I didn't have any education regarding film or writing, especially. I mean, I'm not an intellectual. I didn't go to college. I took some college classes in film and I kicked out because I didn't show up to class. There was a point where I, I knew I had to do something and I started... Uh, going to AFI, American Film Institute up in Hollywood. And I used to volunteer there in exchange for some workshops. And that included going to see Dracula uh, with the producer right there in a Q&A, things like that. And uh, working there, uh, the students were producing stuff all the time. And there was this guy who said, had a list, said, I'm making this movie, The Dying Game. 
which was a knockoff of the crying game. And have you ever read a script spicer? No, but I, I will learn it real fast. And back then I was carrying a Polaroid, following everything, every take to make sure the next take, you know, uh, it was very uh, unscientific. It wasn't like they do it today where, uh, look, my script supervisor has an enormous amount of data. I was just trying to take photos in the on this film, trying to make sure the suits match and the shoes match and uh, the sodas in the left hand and the right hand. So I started down there. That, that sounds like it'd just be a complete headache, though. It's like, well, like, 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 like something's a little out of the way, and it's like, Javier, it's like, oh, you know, I tried, I tried. But I was on the set which is what I wanted to do. Uh, I did a lot of work as an extra in, uh, in Hollywood, and I would do this extra gigs just to have money. But I wanted to be on the set, so a lot of times I would go and sneak all the way up to the cameras and where the directors were, and I would be getting kicked out all the time for things like that. I just wanted to be on the set and see what it was like. Is that what kind of uh, led, like, uh, years later, like leading up to shorts, which led to Region Rat and uh, yeah, then, yeah, uh, yeah. Do Justice? Yes, yeah, just little by little. Uh, I got a great mentor at Sony because I used to sneak in uh, at Sony in Culver City a lot, and they would carry me out all the time. And, ev and eventually, uh, I met Jimmy Honore, which uh, back there he was the vice president of post production. And the guy said, What are you doing? And I said, oh, I'm trying to have to make movies and all that stuff. And he said, Okay, well, let's let's get you going somewhere. He got me a job working with Barbara Streisand on The Mirror Has Two Faces in post production. So that was another event where I was working at Barbara's house for six months. Um, so it, it was a great environment to learn from people. They were really up there, you know. Yeah. What, what was that like working with her? Was that like, a, I, I can't quite put my finger on like Barbara Streisand. She seems all right. But then someone that famous, like, tend to be like, uh, oh, yeah, they're, they're, they're nice on camera. But you get them behind the scenes like. Ugh. Well, she's very particular because um, she knows what she likes. Yeah. You know, she will say, I don't like that. I think if James Cameron would say, I don't like it, uh, they'll be like, okay. But she will say, I don't like it. And they go, ah, she's difficult to work with, you know? Oh. Uh, but I mean, she was, I mean, I always was very respectful that she knew exactly what she wanted. And as I was struggling back then, and I would say, you know, I did something and I hate it. She goes, that means you learned something. You did something, now you don't like it because you learned through the process and now you can do the next time you do something better. She goes, I just give me this movie. I want to change some things, but you know, it is what it is. So, ba uh, so basically she's got kind of like the collaborator mentality of like, the, no, the, the, no, no. This whole she likes what she likes. Oh, okay. The, uh, <laughs> yeah. And same with me. I'm a control freak. So yeah. everything with me, sometimes you ask a producer is a fight because if I believe in something, I just like kind of stick to that. Yeah. Otherwise it doesn't work for me. Well, I mean, you still got to take good ideas when they come to you. Yes. Yeah, of course you can see that everything, but all, yeah. ultimately you have to look at the big picture. Barbara was always like that, but she's not a collaborator. She's more of a, I want to do this, and I don't really need notes. I know this is going to work, or it's not going to work. But as a person, as a someone who was way above me, uh, she was super sweet to me, super nice. And uh, also looking at your uh, upcoming, like you got uh, Do Justice, obviously, uh, coming out on demand, digital theaters, November 24th. But you also have a uh, uh, screenplay for Ruthless. A Baladeta de Hortensia and Rumor. Ru Ruthless is coming up in December 15th. Oh, sweet. But did, Ruthless did, is coming December 15th. Uh, were you just a workhorse? Like, uh, like were all these four scripts like done around the same time or were these like years? Well, I was work? lucky enough well, when I, well, no, when I was um, pushing this movie, the producers liked it. Um, Matisuma Esparza and Elias Aksume liked the script. They gave me a big opportunity because I wasn't proven. And they said, okay, we're going to let you direct this movie. But they liked the script so much. I said, you know what? We have a couple of scripts that we're not happy about it. I wonder if you would like to rewrite them. Oh, nice. And that's how Black Warrants came out. So I was writing Black Warrants while my movie was on a schedule to be shot in a year or something like that. Uh, and then uh, they gave me the script from Ruthless, and I didn't like it, and I didn't even want to work on it. He says, okay, how about just make sure it's in Las Vegas? And the main character is a guy and do whatever you want. <laughs> so I wrote Ruthless and they got uh, Dermot Mulroney to play in it. And I watched the movie and it's pretty good. And you said that's coming good. out in uh, December? 15th, yeah. Nice. It was directed I... by Art Camacho, which is a guy who's done stunts for a long time. So he really gets action, which I don't. Actually, it's hard for me. He's really good with stunts, stuff like that. 
So they showed the movie like after we shot ours. And uh, I just got the poster. If you look online, you'll see the poster with Dermot. It's a really cool poster with orange axes and all that. Well, that's, really. that's going to be pretty exciting for you, having like two movies on uh, night. I know. Back to back, but almost back to back. It doesn't back. matter. No, it's just great. I think it's, you know, and people like him. That's great. They don't like him. Well, that's not going to be so much fun. But yeah, I, I, I judge on this one. I, th- I think he'll do all right. <laughs> but uh, we-, well, we hope so. But uh, we have a what's in the box segment. In this box, we have people put in movies that they think are lesser seen, or it's like, ah, that movie is really good, but no one talks about it. Is there a movie you'd like to put in the box? I'm not following that. Tell me again. Oh, so this would be a movie that you really like that you wish more people would talk about. So the idea is that you put a movie in the box, and then each week we pull a movie out of the box that someone put in there and go, oh, this is a movie we're watching for the week. Okay. And where the question is? Oh, what's a movie you would like to put in the box? that we would pull out in the future. Just, just something you think's lesser seen that's really good that you really like that you any, would Any movie in the world. Movies any movie work. in the world. Oh, 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 God. Oh, well, um, I will always put the Shawshank Redemption in any box as number one to read, watch, or listen. The next 10 for me, if I'm sorry, maybe I shouldn't say 10. Um, but <laughs> go for it. I, I can go on and on, but I mean, I, I, I love human drama, so I will put Angela's Ashes, The Green Mile, those are the movies that the human raging bull, anything that has that kind of drama totally gets to me. And that's the kind of movies I want to make, the movies I want to watch. I'm, again, I'm not a big superhero guy. Yeah. I really like this grounded drama. And when it comes to comedies, I tend to like uh, British comedies a little more as they seem to be more realistic with their characters. Like Notting Hill is a movie that, you know, it's, it's, it's just all the characters are funny, but they don't go over the top and sometimes... You know, American comedies would seem to go a little bit on the path. Come on, that would really never happen. Well, uh, Javier, uh, thanks for joining me. And Do Justice will be available in theaters. Thumbs up there. On demand and digital on November 24th. And congratulations. Uh, Well, thank you so much for for the time. I really appreciate you making the effort to watch it and talk to me. Yeah. It 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 was a, it was a fun one. So hopefully, uh, was, that, was was there anything that you particularly liked that you thought, uh, okay, at least I haven't seen that before, or well, that was so cheesy. <laughs> I I really love Jeff Fahey's villain. He he really came across strong. I mean, I, I know you said you you don't like the uh, the superhero comparison, but that's kind of part of what drew me there because he he's not over the top like Nicolas Cage when Nicolas Cage goes full Cage, but he's just over the top enough where it's like this guy's bad news, and 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 I'm kind of I'm kind of buying him as a villain. Which yeah. usually in movies like this, you get a villain that's like just blank face guy that has no sort of personality, and I I think he was really strong in this. Yeah, well, Jeff's character was a lot of fun to me because uh, he's still who he is, but he's got to deal with mundane, like your wife. Yeah. Like you're a uh, boss yelling at you in front of people, which yeah. is... Yeah. Uh, so some of the moments when you see him vulnerable and about to pop his lid. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm glad you enjoyed that. Thank you so much for sharing. Oh, yeah, uh, definitely. And thank you for coming on, and good luck with the uh, Do Justice and all the rest of your movies coming out. I'm looking forward to watching those as well. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. I'm here with uh, Nicholas Michael McGovern and Philip DeWitt for uh, the movie Liberty. I gotta say, this movie uh, gutted me. A lot of what the movie does is it breaks the fourth wall and talks to the audience, talking to me. And uh, kind of holds me culpable for a lot of the animal cruelty, uh, specifically with like zoos. I think it's kind of uh, specifically pointing at, but just in general, I wonder. Like a lot of people might, when they watch stuff like this, they kind of uh, all of a sudden get defensive. I don't watch movies like that. I'd like to look inward and see where I'm messing up. With that said, what was kind of the idea behind this, the choice of breaking the fourth wall and to use that to get your point across? Well, I'll speak on it. I think this is, Phil might might speak more eloquently about the origins of it, but it was um, it was a daunting prospect for me as, as an actor. I'd, I'd done it a little bit in theater before, but never on film. And sort of talking down a lens can be a scary void, uh, but it became really empowering. Yeah, I hear you. It's 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 deeply inquis- inquisitive of, of the audience watching it. And, you know, we just got off another 
call with someone else and and it's like what do you want an audience member to take away and and i think it's the the questioning you're talking about right because this messaging is also coming from someone who's kidnapped six people locked them in a cage and is psychologically torturing them for for a number of weeks matt's not exactly standing on high moral ground which i think really helps the ambiguity of this i think this is also an exploration of the kind of extremist psychology that we're seeing ravage our country yeah so yeah to kind of bump off that like Your character isn't, but your character isn't real. This is a movie. So this is a, hey, what if this happened? What do you think of this now? And I think that's where, like, if, you know, Matt's character did that in real life, it would just be automatically dismissed exactly for the reason you said. But this is a this is a what if situation. This is a movie. Mm -hmm. And now let's watch it play out. Okay. Now, with with that out of the way, what do you think of it now? And I think it's really effective. I think it works also because there is a story behind that. You know, we, we, we do not just deliver all the messages that the film conveys about the fragility of life, about the suffering of wild animals in captivity. We could choose, I mean, would have been able to make a documentary. But, I mean, with a story behind that, you know, but... And what Matt is doing compared to the mental and physical breakdown of those six people inside the cage. I think uh, choosing a thriller is, you know, it was probably, it was great to deliver all the messages inside of the movie. With narrative features like Liberty, you got a lot more room to play, a lot more tools to at your disposal than, like you said, with the documentary. Because with the documentary, well, first of all, in my experience, the documentaries that are most effective, the people that need to see it the most never do. But with a movie like Liberty, it's like, oh, cool, I'll watch a thriller. And then they'll be able to sit back and just kind of take it in. And then maybe by the end of the movie, they'll be like, wait, I got some thoughts. I'll, I'll consider this a bit. Yeah, man. Yeah, maybe the film will evoke a strong emotion, strong discussion, maybe lead to action, who knows? But I mean, yeah, and for sure we have, I mean, footage, we we have sound, and with those two, that's why I like this media. Maybe we can, we can inform, we can entertain, and maybe we can creating an emotion that can lead who knows to action. I also want to point people to uh, onelifeproduction.com. That's the number of anyone listening. It's the number one lifeproduction.com. You seem to have a uh, an idea of film production, but you have an idea of the films you kind of want to highlight going forward. Uh, what, what can you say about onelifeproduction.com? Uh, the thing is mostly about one life because, I mean, we have one life and uh, we live like life is eternal, you know, infinite, but life is finite. And it's true that I saw many, so many people who pass away around me. So I was thinking one day it will be my turn. So I was thinking, uh, as a filmmaker, what do I want to leave behind me? Just, you know, commercials or something that's, you know, or something with my knowledge or the experience speak about those who suffer in silence because one day it will be my turn and I'm going to pass away. So I think all the good that we can do has to be has to be done now. And we don't have to wait and wait and wait. So I say, okay. And then that's the reason why the, the production name is One Life Production because we have one life. Well, I mean, not to get, I didn't smoke enough weed before this interview uh, to get into it too much, but uh, uh, like with, with one life, you know, you have one life, do it now. Uh, but once you're dead, you don't, as far as we know, you don't have the ability to reflect on whether you live that life properly or not. Like, What's kind of your thoughts on that? From what I understand, the idea is you live one life, you want to live it the best way you can. But once you die, you're you're gone. You can't reflect back on, oh, cool, I did the life right. Or, oh, no, I made this mistake. You, like, you're as far as we know, once you die, you die. So you can't reflect back on it. I don't know if benefit's the right word, but like for someone that just wants to just kind of stagnate through life or someone that wants to hurt people or someone that wants to do good like what what does the idea of legacy what what does that mean if Mm. sure i mean i think the idea of legacy is very tied into matt's motivation for doing what he does um it's one thing to say that he feels obviously quite strongly about uh animal rights and, and welfare but it's it's another thing to look at what's the real reason 
why he's doing this, right? And I, I think it was his own sort of misinformed version of a vision quest or rites of passage, a way of trying to give his life and affirm its value and leave a legacy behind. I think that's very much at the heart of of his motivation. And I do think that's a connecting point for, for anything, for anybody rather, uh, watching this film. I, I think we all have an innate desire to do something useful or for something useful to happen as a result of the way we live. If Matt's anything in the in the, in the positive realm, he's at least an example of someone <laughs> in his own misinformed way of someone who put it to action because that's the only way you, you, you leave a legacy, I think. So yeah, it, it's very much centrally tied into motivation and, and I think what the film is asking its, its audience to consider. So it is a good question. Towards the end, and I won't get into spoilers, I'll be vague about it, but I think you'll know what I'm talking about, the uh, phone scene. Mm. The uh, So there's a bit of legacy there as well, because mm. you have very limited time at that. Like, we all have limited time on this earth, but in that position, your, their time is very limited. And what do you say to someone? That whole scene was just heartbreaking to watch. Mm. Kind of what was, uh, what was uh, Phil like? when writing that scene, kind of what was going through your mind during that? And what was it like shooting that? Cause I think uh, like all the actors just have to be incredibly vulnerable in that space. Yes. But uh, which is the case also for all the animals in captivity. It's exactly the same. And they suffer in silence. And from outside, we have no idea or a vague idea about what are the consequences of captivity? What is the consequences of loss of freedom? Hopefully, if I, not hopefully, but now I think we we now have a better idea about what does that mean, loss of freedom. I think we all know now today with all the, with what happened, you know, with the COVID. Or, so we know about what we are talking about, loss of freedom. But for sure, once you don't have any freedom, you start to be vulnerable. Also, like with the with the animal you mentioned in the movie, when the an, animals get euthanized, like. They, they don't get that last phone call it, as the characters do in the movie. I mean, Matt has an entire movie to sort of leave a legacy. And he allots these people 30 seconds to, to sort of put a bow on the entirety of their life, which is very representative of, of what we see in this mistreatment and torture of, of animals in captivity. It's well put. And also another great thing about this movie is like, uh, like all the stuff we talked to from the beginning of this interview till now has been, you know, pretty heavy, but there's there's some real dark comedy in here. Uh, one one of the in the dark comedy also eventually when you think about it, leads back to oh god that's depressing. But like the uh, putting the backdrop of the uh, supermarket behind the cage, it's yeah. like watching it, like watching it, a human deal with that. It's like oh that's that's stupid. That's not going to mean anything to him. Oh wait, probably doesn't mean anything to the animal. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Humor, especially when you're telling a, a story a sort of in your faces, this is in, in more than one sense is is pivotal, I think, to, to hold an audience's attention just from a technical filmmaking point of view, but also like just has to be a part of enriching the story. You know, how do you get someone to, again, to continue to ask those questions? You have to approach it from different storytelling tactics, I think. And Philippe's script was, I think, filled with that. Nicholas, like as an actor, like you read the script, a script can only do so much. It's got to be clear, give everyone that reads it, paint the same picture in their head. But then as an actor, you need to perform that. Like when you read a script that that you like as an actor, what goes through your head and what's your process in kind of bringing that character to life? The best way I can put it is when you cook something. I'm going to add something to this recipe. Is it going to make it better? Or is it, am I just putting more stuff in to put more stuff right. in? Like, what, what, what's your process in that regard? Well, that's great. That's a great question. My my favorite way I've heard it phrased and that I have sort of adopted for myself is tilling the soil. And the ways you're going to sort of till the soil is, you know, it has to change part to part. You know, no no two parts require the same types of preparation which you've spoke on there are certain things you sort of can't avoid not doing but i think you have to trust your your instincts and do work that you you think is going to inform your instincts as best you can because no matter what the preparation is and and my take on it is sort of whatever you think could be helpful you're trying to cram in because on the day that's for any of it to sort of bear fruit so to speak or to to have a, a bountiful harvest it all has to be out of your head 
in your body somehow, but out of your head and you have to deal with what's right in front of you. And part to part, how you sort of approach it, I think, is is you take the first thing that jumps off the page that is of interest to you. There's always going to be a different entry point. You know, for me and this, there was a heavy Native American presence in the script. Phil had done and had had pretty extensive communication in, in his, I think, writing and pre-production process. Uh, with a few different First Nations and Native American groups we were privileged to work with, uh, Stony Dakota of the Great Sioux Nation in Calgary. And so I started reading a lot about Native American groups specific to where this took place. And that led me to the Blackfeet and reading about rites of passage and vision quests. And that was a sort of jumping off point for me. But you follow clues, man. You follow clues and, and um, try and plant good seeds and hope they come to fruition, you know, come time for action to be called. And Phil, uh, as a director and a writer like what what's kind of uh i don't know this but i assume you have two different brains like the phil's brain when he's writing might be different than phil's brain when he's directing like are are there any uh different things or like when you're writing do you just know that you're going to direct it and it's like you can kind of cut corners on that and knowing that you'll be directing it and be able to smooth out those corners or i would say for me the most important Whatever it is, a script or when I'm the director, is to bring emotion. That is the most important. It could be a book or so. For sure, I know the challenge uh, by writing was okay. I have to deliver some information. You know, I have to give some information. But I mean, I think uh, on my side, by making a trailer, a feature. Just information, that's not that's not enough. Okay, you can have information and a story. Okay, that's great. For me, if you don't have the emotion, if you if we're not able to transmit an, an emotion, then I mean I mean it's uh, emotion is the key, is the key for me. So okay. Because if you're attached, if you if you get an emotion, okay, you're gonna start to speak about the movie, you're gonna I mean, the, in the way you, you're going to absorb the information will be completely different. And it's about sharing, you know, uh, some strong messages with the audience. How is it possible? The best tool is the use the emotion. So for me, it's writing, am I thinking about that? Not too much information. But the one I was directing is, okay, uh, we need, we want emotion, we want emotion, whatever, what kind of emotion. And for sure, I mean, I, I, I like to give to the actors a kind of freedom because they're going to give their lines with all of their background. Uh, but for me, sadness, that's the way I will express, you know, the sadness. And for sure, I mean, the cast is amazing. So, I mean, uh, yeah, all, all the cast is amazing. So, I mean, that's the reason why, I mean, I decided to work with them. Uh, it's, uh, yeah. And what's a, what's the back and forth with that? Like, uh, Phil, you as a director and Nick, you as an actor, like w- what's kind of your work relationship as far as getting that emotion across? Cause Nicholas, I'm assuming you read the script and you have an idea in your head, but maybe what you're doing is not exactly what Phil's looking for, or maybe vice versa. Maybe Phil had an idea and Nick pulls something out. It's like, I didn't think of that. Just keep going there. Like what's the work relationship like between the two of you as far as that goes? Terrible. Just kidding. All right. <laughs> well, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was really wonderful. Philippe's a great facilitator of, I mean, what he says is true about this, the sense of freedom. I, I really appreciate, you know, you don't need perfect notes as an actor. I think what you need is the sense that someone is in the trenches with you and that the best idea is going to win. If we can put our ego aside and just get to the heart of what is the most honest and provocative way to tell this scene right now is how you go about communicating about it. But Phil always operated and gave me a a very long leash and was very kind of gentle with the suggestions take to take. I've heard it once said that great directing is about sort of dropping the smallest pebble in the water and seeing how it ripples out. Because if you drop a rock in and you create a wave, it's hard to get your actor back in. And so Phil's collaborative nature and his way of creating mood and tone on set, and he used music very effectively doing that. He used lighting very effectively doing that. And the way notes were given very effectively to all sort of facilitate that made you open and receptive to giving him the take you wanted to give and and finding the take he wants you to give. And maybe there's something in between. But, I, you know, I loved working with this guy. And and I can't wait to do it again. I guess I'll end with the same thing we end with everything. We have a what's in the box segment. 
and in the box we have people put movies in that uh they think are underseen that they really like or maybe they're popular movies but it's just something that's personal to you that you really enjoy what's a movie that each of you would like to put in the box oh tell no please 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 i'm between yourself an underseen movie it doesn't have to be underseen but it's usually what people go for or just cool. something that's personal to you, like, oh, I saw this when I was 12 and I loved it ever since. And it's okay. part of me. I think for me, Philip Seymour Hoffman is everything you could have asked for in an actor. I think transformative when he needed to be and never in a superfluous way, um, always in service of storytelling. Nobody fought harder for the characters he portrayed. Obviously, deeply intelligent and deeply feeling. Um, and I think we saw all that in, you know, what he won an Academy Award for in Capote. It's one of my favorite films. And, you know, that collaboration was with, with him and, and Dan Fireman and the whole, I mean, I, I love that film. <laughs> I think it's everything you could want in an actor. And Mr. Bennett, you know, obviously is, is a force to be reckoned with and a hell of a first feature for him. So I'll just, I'll just, uh, I'll just mention one of my favorite films and say Capote, I guess. All right. And Phil? I would say uh, probably two movies that impact me uh, for sure is uh, Dear Hunter, you know? Mm. The arc of the characters. I don't know. I think that I saw that movie for sure 10 times. And another movie that speaks a lot to me is Lawrence of Arabia. Also, I mean, the arc of the character is amazing from the beginning. You see how you, I mean, yeah, those, those two examples of movies that impact me a lot. But also from all the movies from Chapin, uh, by how he was able to bring emotion in all of his movies. Well, so I am a big fan of Charlie Chapin, of course. Nice. Well, those are great picks. And yeah, Nicholas, Phil, thank you for joining me. You guys made a great movie. I think people are going to have fun with it just as a thriller aspect. But I also hope they kind of get the the message you're trying to send out because uh, that that's important, too. Thanks, Eric. So thank you for joining me. Thank you, Eric. Thank you.